Java code, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much from my side as well that you're all here tonight. I know I appreciate it. It's the last talk of the conference. And I'm going to talk about fuzzing Java code, as you hopefully expected. My name is Tobias Ospilt, and sometimes I'm also called uh, Floyd. There's no really good story behind it, but um, that's just what we, what I am or who I am. So uh, my co-founder, Martin Schobert, and me, we founded Pentagrid AG. And uh, at Pentagrid, we hack things. So we do uh, penetration testing and security analysis for uh, companies, mainly in Switzerland and Germany. And we have been doing this for a decade already. Um, and this is my main op occupation, really. So Pentagrid, pen testing. And apart from that, I'm also lecturing at Zurich University of Applied Sciences. So I'm a lecturer for information security. And as a third thing, I'm also participating with the Cybersecurity Liechtenstein Association. That's uh, where we play CTF. And basically everyone is invited. But one of our main purposes is to prepare uh, young people between 15 and 25 for the European Cybersecurity Challenge, where we play uh, for or in the EU against other countries, and um, we're basically uh, pr um, training the team Liechtenstein for this yearly competition. So these are the main th three things I'm doing, uh, information security-wise, and as you can see, I just like uh, blue logos, basically. So what I'm going to talk about today um, First of all, I want to talk a little bit about the tools we're going to see today and um, and who created them. Then I want to do a very quick uh, one-slide introduction into fuzzing. So what is fuzzing? We'll look at it from an abstract um, point of view. And then we're going to look at one fuzzer in particular, AFL. It's a very popular fuzzer by now. And uh, this is going to be um, much more uh, on the topic and technical. And then we're going to uh, talk about JQF AFL, which is basically taking the entire idea of this AFL fuzzer, which is very um, well-known and very successful, and take it to the Java side. So somebody um, took the entire idea of AFL to the Java side. And then we're going to talk about the different bug classes we can find. I think this is probably the most important thing uh, to realize when you do Java fuzzing. So what can you find? And then I'm going to show you JQF Zest. And I'm really um, looking forward to this part because this should be closest to what your Java developers do in their daily uh, business. And uh, you can really take home and try uh, for yourself. So AFL is... Um, the short version for American Fuzzy Lop. It's um, created by Mikhail Zalewski when he was working at Google. And it lists about 80 contributors um, on, on, on its website. So there are many, many forks of AFL. And a lot of people use it for different things, for fuzzing, or the, at least the idea is used for many different things, to fuzz Python code, to fuzz on Windows, to um, test things on different platforms and so on. And it's not really maintained by uh, Mikal anymore, at least there was no official announcement saying, hey, I'm not maintaining it anymore, but uh, there were no more new releases. So now there's AFL++. Um, it's maintained by Mark Heuse, who's all, also very well known in our uh, community, the IT security community, and uh, a couple of other people. But then when AFL++ come out, came out and all the new features were added there, at one point Google decided, well, we also want to publish uh, the official AFL. So there's now also a Google AFL version, um, which is let's say, uh, very basic still, or what, what the last release of the official AFL was. So all the new features are more or less in AFL++, and um, there haven't been many new feature releases from the Google side. So there are a lot of forks, as uh, it's very normal for a lot of open source projects. 
And uh, I just wanted to let you know this is not my tool, but I'm, I'm kind of using it a lot. So AFL finds security issues. I think uh, this is a list of uh, projects where it found security issues. And, well, I think they just stopped at one point listing all uh, the different software where security issues were found. So it's very successful, and I think this shows it, shows it uh, really well. When we talk about JQF, so the, the entire thing taken to Java, it was created by Rohan um, at Berkeley University, and it lists about six contributors, so six people are involved in, in creating it and maintaining it, and it's, yeah, as I said, the entire idea of AFL for Java. And there were two other fuzzers that also tried a similar thing, but those two uh, are more or less already unmaintained. And, um, yeah, I haven't used them for a while. So I think JQF is really the one that, that was successfully um, implementing it and is still maintained. There are two main things in JQF. One is called JQF AFL, which is really using AFL as well. And the other one is JQF Zest. And we're going to look at both of them today. And JQF finds bugs as well. Um, I have to say it's not necessarily security issues. So it finds bugs, but it's also security issues. So we're going to talk about this later. But um, the, the reason why this list is so small, I think, is because, well, just not a lot of people uh, tried it yet, so this list isn't longer. So what's fuzzing? Fuzzing is the process of feeding input into a program, and we do it in an automated way to find undesired behavior. Now, undesired behavior is usually a bug, and noticing that we found a bug, we call this uh, capability instrumentation. So being able to see what the program is doing and being able to detect the bug um, is done through uh, instrumentation. So for, a, uh, for example, for a simple C program, this can mean a crash. Now, if we look at the same concept and from an AFL perspective, we can exactly do this. So we can use AFL and it's file-based. So it uses a file and it will feed it into a program. And the good thing is that AFL will notice when new behavior is triggered inside the program. So it will know which code paths are taken, and then it's able to uh, prefer interesting inputs for the program. So again, noticing that we have different behavior in the program, uh, we can do that through instrumentation. Now. Let's look at more um, real-world examples. So we have uh, libpng, which is a library to parse PNG files, and we have a picture of a rabbit. We can mutate this picture of a rabbit and feed it into the program, and it will hopefully uh, trigger different code paths inside libpng until we find a lot of uh, different code paths through libpng, and we're, trigger, we're triggering a lot of different behaviors, maybe even all behaviors that are there for libpng, until we find this undesired behavior. So at one point, hopefully, we find some bug by inputting something special. Now, this is how AFL looks like. So this is the UI of AFL, and I, I don't want to talk about all of the details today because it's a little bit uh, big. But on the top right corner, you see the overall results, and we want to talk about that today. So let's go back to this image we had before, libpng. So for libpng, if we had a run which would say total pass 871, we would have been able to trigger 871 different behaviors inside libpng, and unique crash means 124. So we found 124 crashes for libpng. This is just an example. This is a very old version of libpng. So we found 124 crashes inside libpng, and we were able to notice it because of instrumentation. And this is 
a simple crash. For, for C programs like libpng, we simply find crashes. Now, there's a third parameter called unique hangs, and it says 221. It means that when we were feeding um, a file into libpng, 221 different files took too long to process. So AFL decided, well, this takes too long. I want to abort this test, and I just let you know that there are 220 files that uh, take longer than I'm, uh, I'm, I want to wait. So this could mean it will take a lot of time to process or just a little bit more than AFL uh, wanted to wait. Now, so far we were talking about C programs and AFL. Now let's take a big jump to the Java world. Now we're talking about something completely different because we're applying it to Java. So of course we don't have libpng anymore, but we have a Java library that is also able to parse PNG files. So we have Chama image IO as a target and we still have um, jqf that is feeding input and triggering different paths. So the blue part is the same and we have still unique hangs. So we still know which uh, inputs take too long to process. But what does crashes mean in the case of jQuery? That's the basic question mark. And I want to answer this question mark by doing the jQuery tutorial with you. So there is this jQuery tutorial on the GitHub web page, and I made a small video, and I'm going to explain what we do. So we have this test class that parses a PNG file with image IO. So we have the test class, and we can look into it. We have a add fuzz annotation. We have a function called test read. We can feed it an input stream, which is what jQuery AFL um, expects. We give it to image IO and say, parse this as a PNG file. And then if an IO exception occurs, we say we don't care about IO exceptions. So IO exceptions occur whenever there's something inputted, which is not a PNG file, obviously. So I hope, yeah, we're going on. So we can compile this test class with uh, jqf and the a regular java compiler and then run jqf afl fuzz on it and it will happily take our test png file start to feed it into java image io mutate it and then hopefully we will find new paths which we do on the top right and uh, the execution speed as we see is like roughly 500 uh, tests per second which is already pretty quick and we find new behavior triggering inside Java image IO. Now, this was the, the tutorial. So I thought, why not change the tutorial a little bit? And instead of PNG, let's test GIF files. So I just change all the occurrences of PNG to GIF and run the exact same tutorial from the JQF website on a different format. Again, Java image IO is able to parse GIF files and we run it again. And we're finding crashes. So this was, I think, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and we're still finding 22 crashes. So we still don't know what crashes are. I haven't told you that yet, but at least we noticed that well, the tutorial was obviously run a lot of time from the maintainer, and he um, told Java about all the bugs they found, and they fixed it. But nobody bothered to change the tutorial just a little bit to find new security issues or not security issues or bugs or whatever it might be. So I just want to tell you that um, it's still very easy to find bugs, whatever they might be in Java and in a lot of libraries, because nobody's doing it. And jQuery has been around for two years on GitHub now, and nobody did that. So um, this is what we get. Now, here comes the solution to the question I had. So what are crashes? It's a little bit disappointing for the security guys of you, but well, instead of crashes, we only get uncaught exceptions. 
So because Java is memory safe, we cannot get memory corruptions and our program doesn't crash, but we get things such as index out of bounds exception. So if Java would be a memory unsafe language, which we would have a memory corruption, but we don't in this case. So this is not a really a security issue, but this is a robustness issue inside your Java code. So as a developer, you probably still want to know about these things, but it's not really a security issue. So as I said, the red part, the crashes are just un uncaught exceptions. Now, when you look at this uh, image, you can still see that there are unique hangs. And in the case of JQF AFL, that's actually the more interesting part because that's where we find the security issues. So I was able to find five different infinite loops inside Java programs uh, by using the fuzzer. So I was able to uh, fuzz the Apache Tika uh, project with JQF AFL and I found an infinite loop. So if it would parse my image, uh, my file, then it would uh, just use up all the CPU that was there and will run in circles and the entire Java process would probably at one point be unusable. I was able to do the same for JUnrar, a library to uh, to unpack RAR files. I was able to do this for PDF box, which is as well an Apache project. And I was even able to do this for Apache Common Compress. Now Apache Common Compress, I think if you have to unpack a zip file um, in Java, you usually use Apache Common Compress. And this was exactly back in the zip archive input streamer. So if you try to unpack my zip file, it would result in an infinite loop and your Java process will never return. So I was, and the last CV was even in Java itself. So in one of the standard libraries, it's a little bit exotic because it's a riff reader uh, parser, but still even the standard, uh, standard library of Java um, had a bug where I was able to trigger an infinite loop where it, the code would never return as soon as you call it with my input file. So this might be the, might have been the interesting part for some of the security researchers. You can find infinite loops, but it's, um, it's just part of it. But now what I want to do first is take this entire thing a little bit closer to your development life cycle. So in your company, you're, uh, you're developing Java programs and usually programmers have to do unit tests and Writing unit tests is probably not the favorite part of programming for a lot of uh, Java developers. So wouldn't it be nice to have at least a fuzzer that is very easy to use and generates very good inputs for your code? And this is now possible because of JQF Zest. So JQF Zest takes the entire AFL approach. So everything we just talked about being able to trigger code paths, knowing when new code paths are triggered, and using these files. It's doing all that. So everything we just talked about. But apart from that, it's also unit using uh, JUnit quick check generators, which means uh, we can now not only fuzz Java code that expects uh, input streams, but also all kind of other simple um, Java types. So the main things of JQF test, which are really good, is that it's not only for input streams, but uh, more complex Java types. And it will also understand preconditions. So if you have ever written a JUnit test, then um, it, you might have written an assume statement, which basically says, so if you get an input as a test and it doesn't... Um, it doesn't adhere to certain constraints, then please don't run the test. So you do an assume statement at the beginning of the test to make sure that whatever you get um, is in the in a valid form. So this is basically to test uh, to to skip tests that are um, that don't don't make any sense. And the third thing is a Maven plugin. So JQF says this is completely available as a Maven plugin, which means you don't need to install any command line tool anymore. You don't need um, 
to install AFL or JQF itself, but just uh, write it as a dependency in your Maven file and it will pull it down and install it by itself. So this allows really easy continuous integration. And this might be also very important for uh, continuous integration platforms that can now run a fuzzer. So this was the theory to it. I think uh, the developers might be looking for something like this, which is a little bit more applied. So this is an example from the maintainer of uh, JQF, uh, Rohan, who did a test on a data structure called Patricia try. Now, for this code, it's not really important what a Patricia try is, but we have our add fuzz annotation again, so it just means please fuzz this function. But what we can do now is we can pass a map and a string, and it will automatically know how to generate a map. It will automatically know how to generate a string because we have JUnit quick check generators for these two types. And uh, we don't have to care about that. The fuzzer will just know how this works. So we pass in a map, which maps strings to integer, and a string, which is just the key. And we assume at the beginning, so here we only want to test um, maps that already contain the string. So we have... Um, this assume statement and test will try to understand this assume statement and only generate inputs that already comply to this assume statement. So it's very powerful there again. It will put it into the Patricia try. So we will parse the map into the Patricia try and afterwards it will simply say, okay, I assume or I assert that the Patricia try now contains my key. I mean, this is very basic. Every data structure, nearly, um, if you put something in, then you, if you ask afterwards, is it still in there, then it should still be in there, right? So this is a very basic test. But he found a bug, and this is actually a very interesting bug. It's uh, marked as priority critical, and uh, it's still unresolved. So it's still open. It was found by uh, Rohan, the uh, maintainer himself of um, JQF, and it was reported to Commons Collection and Apache project. And it, it says it ignores trailing null characters, which means if we have a new Patricia try and we put in X and we say, is X still in the Patricia try? Then it will say, yes, X is, of course, in the Patricia try. But if we then put in x backslash u0000, and afterwards we ask, is x still in there? It will say, no, x is not in there anymore. So this violates every assumption of a developer of this data structure. When you put something in the data structure and you put the second thing in it, then the first thing should still be in there. And this means from an attacker point of view, from an information security point of view, you can, by putting something inside the data structure, you can delete from it. And this, I don't really know what the implications are of this, but as this is a very fundamental data structure, this can be really bad. And it's not only, as far as I know, it's not only present for Patricia try, but they have these problems for, for uh, some of the other um, data structures in, inside Apache Commons. Now, the UI of JQF SEST looks kind of similar uh, than AFL. I mean, not, not exactly. But we, again, get the elapsed time, so how long the fuzzer was running so far. And it says no time limit. So I didn't specify a time limit, but if you have a continuous integration platform and you want to say, okay, for each build we're doing, please run the fuzzer for five minutes, you can do that. So you can say in our continuous integration, we um, allocate five minutes for the fuzzer. Unique failures, that's a combination of everything we've seen so far, everything that can go wrong. So it's uncaught exceptions, it's assert statements, and it's hangs. So we find all kind of undesired behavior in there. 
And we also get the execution speed, which is very important to notice here. It's In this case, it's three times faster than before, so it's really, really, really quick. So you can imagine, because of um, JQF is very smart and it knows when a new code path it, is triggered and it's able to, to uh, feed a lot of inputs, it's very good to find its way through your code that you've written. And the total coverage, the branches, is, is the same as the path. So it found 579 different paths through, um, through your binary, uh, or through your code. Now, for this presentation, um, I thought I need to demonstrate the, uh, how powerful JQF Zest can be. And I did a run. Uh, for a certain library, and I was looking for a library, and I thought, why not use a cryptographic library? Because people will notice that when something goes wrong in a cryptographic library, then uh, that's bad, right? So in Java, a lot of people use Bouncy Castle. Who has used Bouncy Castle before? Oh, very nice. Yeah, so we have a lot of Java developers here. And it's also Bouncy Castle is in every of your Android phones. So this is not like theory. This is now getting applied. Um, so I par I tested the ASN one parser of Bouncy Castle. Now again, it's not it's not important that you know what the ASN one what ASN one is, but it's a very fundamental uh, structure. So if you have a certificate on the very basic, uh, it, it's usually stored as ASN one. So although it might be there or whatever PEM encoding and so on, but uh, on the basis, it's very often uh, ASN1. So I ran um, JQF Zest against Bouncy Castle ASN1 parser, and that's this is a video of how I did it. So first of all, we need to write a test class again. This is just as before. We have at fuss. We now parse in a byte array. That's nice because uh, we have qu uh, quick check generators for that. We say parse it as an ace in one input stream, take out all objects, and if you get an IO exception, we don't care about IO exceptions because we know those can happen. So we only need the test class and the dependency file for Maven. We only write two files. The dependency file will say, okay, I'm going to use JQF, please install it. I'm going to use quick check generators and I'm going to use JQF fuzz. So I just specify my dependencies I need f uh, to run this uh, test. And of course, I also need bouncy castle, um, the target I'm, I'm, I'm going to fuzz. So this is just like regular Java development. And then I can say, Maven, please compile the test class and it will pull down all the dependencies, which was already done, and then compile them, and we'll say build successful. And then I can ask Maven itself to run the fuzzer. So I can say, jQuery fuzz, please fuzz this class. And this function called test with byte array and run it. Afterwards, we should get our uh, known UI of jQuery Zest. And you can already see in a couple of seconds, because it's going so fast, we find seven unique failures. So we found seven, seven distinct bugs inside the ASN1 parser in one minute, 22 seconds. Now, as soon as I looked at all these bugs I found, most of them, again, were interesting for developers because now the Bouncy Castle developers know how their code can fail and there were class cast exceptions and so on. But one bug was really interesting because it allowed me to fill up the Java memory and basically crash the Java process by using all memory. So I'm able to send a very small ASIN1 input and Java will try to unpack it and unpack it and allocate really big arrays for it. And that will use up all memory. And at one point, the Java process will die because it doesn't have any memory left. So again, we have a denial of service condition here. So the real success story behind this is not really that I found a bug, but 
when I reported this to Bouncy Castle, they were really interested and said, oh, this is interesting. How did you find them? And I, I supplied them with the two files and how to build it with Maven and so on. And they started to use it for their entire Bouncy Castle, um, or not the entire, but at least they said they use it for other places as well. And they started to uh, foster GPG implementation as well. And I guess they found a lot of bugs as well there. So... As you can see, nearly every library I try to fuss, I find bugs. So I hope uh, I can animate some of you to, to try this fuzzer. Okay, let's talk about the bug classes. So far, um, we've seen uncaught exceptions, which are not real security issues usually. Um, we find denial of service issues like using all the CPU, infinite loops, and uh, using all the memory and so on. But I hope that at one point, with more instrumentation, we're also able to find other bug classes. Now, I'm saying this, hopefully we will, because this will probably not be easy to do automated, like everything automated. But as soon as you as a developer know a little bit what you expect from your code, you can do assert statements and then uh, JQuef will try to violate these assert statements so you will notice bugs. And I think it will be really easy to, to find um, bugs by writing very little Java code. Now, it's very hard to answer which kind of bug classes we might find with uh, JQuef. But I think there is the possibility that we find cryptographic bugs with um, JQuef Zest simply by, for example, doing differential fuzzing. So we need, uh, we take two Java libraries that do crypto and we give them input generated by JQuef Zest. And at the end, it will output the result. And if both libraries have the same result, everything's fine, but if they have different results, then something is going wrong, right? Both implementations should do the same. So I think it, there might be, um, uh, fuzzing might improve with this um, code coverage we have with JQF Zest, so we might be able to find cryptographic bugs. Um, I quickly tried to run which approve if some of you know that project with JQF Zest, and I didn't find any new uh, uh, bugs, but uh, really that was just a half an hour test, and uh, I, I need to do some more testing on it. So my, maybe um, we can reuse existing work and just plug in JQF Zest and then find new bugs. Cross-site scripting and uh, cross-site request forgery. These are um, very, very common web application vulnerabilities. I think this is not a good approach to, to find these kind of things. I can't imagine how you would in instrument your code to find these things. So, I mean, there, there are probably ways to do it, but it's probably um, too much work to do. Whereas injections, it depends a little bit on how you, on what kind of injection you have. But for example, NSQL injection, I can imagine that you, if you, for example, fuss um, inputs from, from a user, and then at one point you get an SQL exception, then you might have found an SQL injection as well, right? So this might be possible. It depends on the case. <coughs> Server-side request for tree. So Server-side request for tree means we can send something to a server and the server will do a network connection for us to a certain place, which can be a big issue. And I think there's also room there. And I'm going to talk about it uh, on the next slide. And then logic bugs. Can we find logic bugs? Well, we can find logic bugs because I already showed you a logic bug. The Patricia try example is a logic bug. If you put something in a data structure, put something else in there and the first thing vanishes, then that's a logic bug. So I think the future of Java fuzzing might involve the Java security policy manager. The Java security policy manager is a not very well-known feature of your Java runtime environment. And it allows you to specify a policy that says, okay, the entire Java program we're going to run now is not allowed to open up any network connections. 
That's just an example. And you might ask, well, but uh, how, how does that help with, with fuzzing? Well, I have one example that fits really well, and I'm unsure on how many other examples in the future will fit into this uh, use case, but at least for server-side request forgery, I think the Java Security Policy Manager could help. Because can you imagine ImageIO, a library that parses images doing a network connection? Well, you might say, no, I think that's not possible. But actually, there were in the past, not ImageIO, or at least I don't know that ImageIO did it, but other image libraries that when they encountered metadata, they tried to parse the metadata in, a, in an image file. And metadata, one of the formats is XMP. And XMP is a format that is in XML. And XML is a format that can have external references to other servers. So there are image libraries that happily open up network connections for you if you supply the right metadata in the file format. So if we have a Java security policy manager that would say an image library is not allowed to open up network connections, then we will get an uncaught exception. It would say, hey, something tried to open up the network connection. Here's an exception. And we would notice during the fuzzing run. So, at the moment, Java Security Policy Manager is not really necessary to find the bugs um, I've shown so far, but uh, at one point we might use it, and there's a lot more testing necessary, and I'm really looking forward to what is coming in the Java fuzzing area. Now, I hope you enjoyed my talk, um, and I hope I was able to animate some of you um, and you developers to uh, start using JQuef. It's very easy, uh, especially if you use Maven, it's very easy to do a fuzzing run. Um, and also for the security researchers, I hope they can maybe on your next engagement, for example, when you do pen testing. I started doing this because uh, one of my, our customers, they gave me too much Java code and I was fed up with looking at too much fu Java code. So I started fuzzing and I found uh, bugs in their um, server and I was able to use all the, all the memory on their server and they were very happy that I found all these um, issues. So I hope uh, some of you will try it in the future. And I can just say, come to the Java world. There are lots of bugs to discover. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Tobias. Any question? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, um, so every time um, there is a failure or something that crashes, normally before, while you actually uh, solve the coding issue, you should actually also write probably a unit test uh, to test that specific case. Is there a way to actually record the, the inputs that cause crashes so that you are sure that you're going to rerun them in the future every time? Yeah, so I mean, I wasn't able to uh, show all the features of JQuery test, but it actually takes an input directory where you can... Uh, put all the old test cases and it will start fuzzing from there and it will notice, oh, this is like already triggering a lot of code passes that are really interesting. So I will use this file from as a start and it will, as soon as it generates new ones and you get an output directory where the, we call it corpus. So the entire corpus will be stored for you. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so you can do that. You can use it as an input for your next run. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't actually have a question, but uh, you jumped to the conclusion that people didn't try to change the example from fuzzing PNG file to G file. It's just that they didn't report bug or make, made, yeah. made, made it public that they did, but I know. you cannot assume anything about what people are doing with fuzzers, right? Yeah, it, it, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, that's a big problem in the fuzzing world, especially that... Um, so. A lot of people are running fuzzers and they find a lot of bugs, but as long as they're not security issue, they just throw them away. They don't even report them. They don't give it to maintainers. They don't care about robustness because 
Well, th there are probably various different reasons why it happens. So one is, if you're a security researcher, you, you're you paid to find security issues, not regular bugs. Uh, they're boring for you. And uh, the other thing is as well, our entire uh, ecosystem is more and more set up like that because, I mean, bug bounties... They won't pay you for robustness issues. I mean, some started, some started to, uh, to pay you if you just improve certain code, but regular bug bounty programs won't pay you for anything else than security bugs, right? Thank you for uh, mentioning the Google program, uh, which pays you for, uh, submitting security patches to open source code. You can get money from it. What, what company? I didn't hear. I just go on. <laughs> Okay. Do we have another question? Yeah. Is uh, input generation of the faster deterministic or every run different? So that's a cool question. So I know AFL plus plus now has a seat um, uh, command line, so you can say always start with this seat, so it's deterministic. It's, um, if it's really 100% deterministic, you should ask the maintainers. But um, I guess there should also be something similar for JQF. And if it's not, you, you can just um, basically uh, change it to use a seed for the random generator. So I think it should be fairly easy to make it deterministic. Yeah. Any other question? Okay. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks to you all.